In today's episode, we're going to talk about watching paint dry. No, no, sorry. We're going to talk about rock climbing and how to put your focus on the wrong thing. That's right. We're talking about Enterprise, episode 21 of season two, The Breach, originally aired on April 23rd, 2003. Welcome, everybody, to Trek in Time, where, as you should probably know by now, we're talking about every episode of Star Trek in chronological order. We're also taking a look at what the world was like when the episodes originally broadcast. So where are we right now? Well, we're still in Enterprise. And we're talking about the episodes that dropped in the year 2003. So it's still early days for the overall Trek universe, but it's more recent history as far as our world. And we're going to look at the intersection between the two. Who are we? That's what I'm asking, Matt. Who are we? Who are we, Sean? Who Who are are we? we? Well, me, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a published writer. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And with me is my brother, Matt. Matt, how you doing? I'm good. How you doing? I'm doing well. Matt is the originator behind the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell, which takes a look at emerging tech and its impact on our lives. So between me, the writer, and him, the techie, we are trying to be all things Trekkie. <laughs> I, was, I was wondering if you were going to yeah. do that. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> we didn't want to get there, but we did. <laughs> As usual, we invite people to weigh in in the comments. You can find the contact information in the podcast description, or you can write to us through the comments on YouTube. Either one will reach us. We are happy to receive any kind of thoughts about our episodes or the episodes of Star Trek that we're watching. And Matt, I understand you've got some things from a recent episode that you wanted to talk about from our commenters. Yeah. There was a one comment that really caught my eye from AJ Chan on the episode where we talked about Horizon, which was Travis going back home. And it was one of those rare, hey, they're talking about Travis Mm -hmm. episodes. He said, it was great to see some focus on Travis, even if the episode was not well written. Flox rarely has his own episodes, but they found ways of developing him through his interactions with other characters in the plot. Far too often, Travis had nothing to do. Yes. Uh, DS9 did a better job developing Rom and Admiral Ross who were supporting characters. That's why I called this comment out. I thought that was a great, astute comment. I would argue pretty much every other Star Trek series did a better job developing the minor characters than this show is doing. I think they're really giving a short shrift to all of the secondary characters, Hoshi, Travis, even Reed to a certain extent. Yeah. They're basically just focusing on three characters, four, four if you include Phlox. But it's like, it seems like they're incapable of understanding how do you develop a character that you're only talking about every so often? It's yeah. like they throw them a bone and the bone they throw them is a really bad bone. <laughs> it's yeah. like, oh, oh, poor Travis. But yeah. It also feels like there's a certain amount of overpacking that goes on. Yeah. Think about the original series and there were characters that we feel are beloved, but mm-hmm. when you really scratch through the surface, what do we know about Chekhov? Well, he had a Russian accent. Not much. What do we know yeah. about Sulu? There's a couple of episodes where you see him doing things like fencing and he's t- doing some botany. What do we know about Scotty? Well, we know a little bit more about Scotty, but we don't he's know. He's giving it all he can. He's giving it all he can and, and he, can't, he cannot give it no more. And <laughs> some of the characterization came from allowing personality of the actor to shine through. Some of it came yes. through in writing and some of it came through just through traits that were allowed to fill in a gap. Scotty has his accent. Chekhov has his. By this time in the series creation, it feels like they're overpacking the show with backstory and when you overpack with backstory, you are promising something you're not going to deliver on in every case. We know so much about the backstory of all of the main characters in Enterprise, mm-hmm. but how can they possibly give attention to all of those? If we had no idea that Mayweather had grown up on cargo vessels, in, if that wasn't presented in the pilot, mm-hmm. then that re- episode where we see him go home would have been a revelation and it would have felt huge. It would have felt like, oh, this is cool. We've got an opportunity to see more about the guy who flies the ship. We're finding out more about him every episode, as opposed to being told through exposition, all this information about him and Hoshi and Trip and Reed. And we get all this information told to us. 
That invites us to expect more. And then when we don't get it, we're disappointed. And that's I a great that's, assessment. I think that's a yeah. mistake that this show is clearly making, that they had an overly experienced production team and writer's room around creating what was at this point the fourth Star Trek series that they were putting together. And they were at this point overdoing it at the beginning and not allowing them, not coming up with fertile soil to grow in, but just coming in with full fledged, fully grown plants and expecting them Mm -hmm. to take root in a shallow pot of dirt. And it wasn't going to work. So for today's episode, we're going to be talking about, as I mentioned before, the breach. This episode aired on April 23rd, 2003. And what's that? Oh my God, what's that noise? <laughs> That's right, Matt. It's the read alert. It's time for you to read the synopsis from Wikipedia. Last oh, week, boy. our listeners will remember that the Wikipedia entry took Matt about 15 minutes to read. <laughs> this one's shorter. <laughs> this one will not. And I think Matt yes. will be pleased, although still perplexed by how this is considered a synopsis but i think he will be pleased with the overall synopsis so let's okay. let's take a listen the breach is the 21st episode of the second season and 47th episode of the television series star trek enterprise it originally aired on april 23rd 2003 on upn this episode was written by chris black and john shaban from a story by daniel mccarthy robert duncan mcneil directs guest stars include henny stram Mark, Ch- is it Chat? I would say, yeah, Chat. Laura Putney, DC Douglas, and Jameson Yang, alongside the main cast of the show. In the 22nd century, Star Trek Enterprise is asked to. <laughs> Take a deep Now breath. we're actually getting to the episode. This is the in actual the 20- synopsis. Yes. In the 22nd century, Star Trek Enterprise is asked to uh, evacuate three Denobulan geologists from a planet after its controlling government is taken over by a militant faction. All it had to do was that last paragraph. (laughs) That last paragraph, which is basically a sentence, and that's the synopsis. It is arguably the best synopsis we have seen in Wikipedia. However, it is buried underneath all of the preceding information around guest stars and actors and even the network. So, Can I just point out that most of these Wikipedia descriptions strike me as a student that didn't read their book for their book report and is just padding as much stuff as they can. Absolutely. Like it's the 21st episode on the second season and the 47th, the 47th episode of the series. It's mm-hmm. like, how is that pertinent to anything? <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's the, and the way it's written, if it was a full blown elementary school book report, if it was anything like the ones I wrote when I was elementary, in elementary school, it would end with, and if you want to know how it ends, you're going to have to read the book yourself. <laughs> Nicely done. <Sean. laughs> yeah. But So April 23rd, 2003, when this episode aired, what was the world like? Well, Matt, you'll remember yet again, you were still into club. That's right. Mm. 50 cent was still the number one song. Anger management for the second week in a row was the top film. It added 25 million more dollars to its coffers. And on television, April 23rd, 2003, well, we ended up with not good news for Enterprise. My wife and kids and George Lopez were airing on ABC with roughly 8 million viewers. Star Search, that show that Matthew and I cannot recall, was getting 10 million viewers. That 70s show was getting 11 million. American Idol was getting almost 20. A special about psychics on NBC got almost <laughs> 9 million viewers. Oh, that, that hurts. That and, one hurts. And here's, here's, the, here's the, the deepest cut of all, Matt. Dawson's yes. Creek got 3.5 million. And Enterprise struggled along at 3.2. That's right. Oh, this week, Dawson. Enterprise was in last place. And for the week, CSI was the most watched program. On CBS, it earned 25 million views. And in the world at large, from the New York Times, many headlines revolving around Iraq, where the fighting was already over, but now the rebuilding was trying to begin. Iraq was trying to find its footing. And in particular, the Shiites were scrambling for power, and tensions were rising between the northern part of the country and the southern part. And I couldn't help but thinking as I was reading about these headlines, as I was reading these articles in the New York Times from this day in history, that 
this is where the interesting story of this episode sits, which is they go to a planet which has recently gone through a militant, effectively a coup. Mm -hmm. And there is a xenophobic government now in place that is trying to expel any non-native species from the planet. Yep. Unfortunately for us, the viewer, they focus on rock climbing. They focus on <laughs> rock climbing. I, I am yes. going to cut to the chase. People who have been listening to this episode so far have probably picked up a little bit of snark in my voice as I opened the episode by saying, we're watching paint dry. It occurred to me while I was watching this, there is a famous episode of Mystery Science Theater in which the movie depicts a group of people climbing a mountain to find a prehistoric Garden of Eden at the top of this mountain. And the majority of the film is rock climbing. And the joke <laughs> within the episode is that Joel and the bots continue to say to each other, rock climbing, rock climbing, Joel, rock climbing. That's right, Crow, <laughs> rock climbing. I kept thinking that while I was watching this episode. Not you know good I of? when a serious, dramatic show <laughs> evokes the punchlines of Mystery Science Theater as your first response. I was hard pressed to think what could they have been doing that would be less interesting than watching people climb rocks. And just in a big picture way, I would like to invite your thoughts, Matt, right now. What is it that makes people think that watching somebody else climb a mountain is inherently interesting? Okay. I'm going to answer that in a roundabout way. I totally understand why. Because there's movies like, was it K2? There's documentaries about rock climbers that do free climbing with no ropes. Mm -hmm. You're watching because it's like watching NASCAR. They could fall and die at any second. Right. Tension. Right. Tension. Right. Tension. Right. There's no tension here because yeah. these are all main characters. We know they're not yeah. going to fall to their deaths. Yeah. So there's zero tension. And so because there's no tension, it's like watching paint dry. Um, I, I just want to say you were focused on that joke from Mystery Science Theater. And for me, I kept focusing on, God, I don't want to do another one of these Trek in Time episodes where we're just bagging on this show because yeah. it's like there was so much, there's so much potential here that i liked from season one yeah. and a little bit and beginning of season two it's like oh there's something here but we're in this slog right now through this show where it's like dear god can we just get to the next season because yeah. the next season takes a turn in a better direction and has more interesting stories to tell at this point can it feels very this? much like watching the cast uh, use wiffle ball bats to beat the crap out of some roadkill it's uh, like it's oh, they are not given anything worth talking about, and they are all working so hard at doing. I have to give a tip of the hat to the production of this episode, to yes. the directing. Yes. Uh, McNeil, who people will recall, this is not his first time directing for Enterprise, and he played Tom Paris on Voyager. He does what I think is a movie like job of filming a tv series in this episode with getting interesting mm -hmm. angles and a a set that was clearly designed with verticality in mind and in the details around the filming of this episode the actors worked with a stunt coordinator to learn how to successfully repel down the rock face so that they would look like they knew what they were doing i felt bad for the amount of effort that they went into well, they, well, to do something that lacked any kind of real dramatic tension. Well, here, here's, here's the problem where we're probably going to spend most of our time. A plot, B plot. Yeah. Which a is plot. Which is which? A plot is a hard question say, to answer. Gonna, yeah. Right. I was going to about to say, if you had to pick one, it feels like the rock climbing and getting, getting the Dodombulans out is supposed to be the A plot. Yes. The problem is the B plot is the plot that it should have been the only plot. Yes. Because that's where the interesting stuff happened. Yes. And it was a moral debate, a uh, lifelong hatred and cycles of violence, which you could say is the Middle East. It's just like this yes. never ending, just like you're constantly wronging the other side and it's never going to stop this never ending war 
this history of Denobulans and how this other species reacts to Phlox when he sees him. Amazing tension there. Yeah. And then you have this rock climbing aspect of trying to rescue these Denobulans. When they finally get to them, the Denobulans are hysterical of like, we're not leaving. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, I agree with you. They put so much effort into the rock climbing portion of it. It was, it really was well executed, but it was such a pointless storyline. But there were moments that I thought, wow, that's really good filmmaking. Like you pointed out yeah. of, there's a sequence where they fall yeah. and they're sliding down the rock path and Travis, his leg, the only Shatters thing that saves him leg. from falling, yeah. Yeah. his leg gets shunted into this crack in the wall. And that's the only thing that stops them from falling. And I'm watching that moment. My wife's walking through the room and she stops to watch that scene. And both of us together go, Oh, when yeah. he like his leg gets wedged into the wall. It was really well done. So it's like it's it's a shame because it's it's well executed, but this it, it's the storytelling. It always comes back to the storytelling. The problem with this show is not the special effects, it's typically yeah. not the directing, it's never the acting. It always comes down just to the, the storytelling choices. And I wonder if it was some producer or some executive that was saying you have to sex up the show. Yeah. There has to be X amount of action. We can't just have people talking at each other. We have to have something where people are doing something. Yeah. And so they keep trying to shoehorn these action sequences in to a storyline where it doesn't belong. Yeah. And that's what it felt like to me here. Yeah. I felt like there was opportunity, like you, like you pointed out, the A story and the B story. I felt like the B story absolutely filmmakers thought that the Dr. Flock storyline was the B story. I agreed with you mm -hmm. and I agreed with you that it should have taken precedence. I think that there was also a story to be told in the captain trying to, if we had seen somebody from the government that they were talking to on screen, if we had seen more of a debate with the captain saying like, we understand your autonomy and we will leave, but we need to do the right thing. If we had had more opportunity for that kind of debate, that might've held more interest. If we had seen somebody within the government basically saying behind closed doors, look, I agree with you. I want to help you get your people out of here. I don't agree with this new militant group that's in charge. I want to do the right thing for you, but I can't. I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. If we had seen that, that would have had more dramatic tension. The storyline between Phlox and his patient where both sides have been using the other as the boogeyman to scare children is something mm -hmm. that. Star Trek has done before, but I would argue that the way it's handled in this episode in particular is one of the best. It mm -hmm. really, between Phlox and that patient, the back and forth and Phlox's revelation, by the time the episode ended and it ends, it's very, it's very telling. You kind of see inadvertently they show their cards because the episode ends with Phlox. It does not end with the rock climbers. It ends with Phlox. Mm -hmm. We don't even see the Denobulans who have been rescued after mm -hmm. they finally start climbing. We don't see them once outside the caves. We don't see nope. them. We see them in the shuttlecraft leaving, but we do not see them on the Enterprise. We do not see them talking to Phlox. We do not see them talking to the captain. We see Phlox writing a letter to his son that he's estranged from because his son is effectively a racist. Yep. And that storyline, I was just like, my God, they dropped that in in the third act. And it was a very touching moment. It, it was, was incredibly touching. And it, yeah. if that had been pushed into the second act, if that had become the turning point for him of why am I so supercharged about this? It's because it hits me personally. Because I know if my son was here, my son would say, let this guy die. Mm -hmm. That could have been an incredibly charged relationship and Flox's medical ethics wrestling with the personal hurt that he's feeling around his son's relationship to xenophobia that would have been an incredibly dramatic episode and you could have had mm -hmm. conversations between him and to paul around xenophobia mm -hmm. that could have been fascinating for having the scene where to paul steps in and says may i join you and he reluctantly lets her join Suddenly you can hear the air going out of the scene and it doesn't amount to anything. There's not a yeah. moment where like I wanted there to be that moment of him. If he had revealed to her, my son yeah. is a xenophobe. My son would let this man die and having to Paul have an opportunity. What is a Vulcan response to xenophobia? 
it would be evolving literally right now because we know in the future of Trek, we know when when Spock's era, we know that later eras are where Vulcan thinking around the the other is very different. They have the concept of the edict, the mm-hmm. infinite diversity and an infinite combinations. Would that be reflected right now? Or would she say something like, my people have given voice to that idea, but we have had a hard time embracing it. And I'm mm-hmm. only seeing that now aboard this ship. That sometimes the lived experience is the, the real crucible of where these concepts come to play. And it sounds like you're running full speed into that. That yeah. could have been an incredible moment. And instead, it's basically she sips her tea and they say a couple of things and it doesn't amount well, to much. I actually disagree that that conversation that you're talking about between him and Paul in the dining hall. I found very emotional by the end because one, John Billingley, Billingsley's performance is spectacular. In yes, this. yes. There's such nuance to what he's doing that you can see the multi layers of he's trying to do the right thing. He's super uncomfortable with his his people's history, mm-hmm. like the whole. He gets all clammed up, and you can tell he's very tight and tense in these different scenes. Yes, when he's having that moment with Paul. By the end of the conversation, he's crying and he's emotional and he never, ever in the show is this way. And what I liked in that moment, that scene was to Paul, being to Paul, she basically suddenly focuses and is like, I want to, can I help you? It's like, because she recognizes, here's, here's a colleague of mine I've known for years now and he never does this. So clearly this is really distraught. He's in, he's in distress. Mm-hmm. And so it was nice to see to Paul in her own Vulcan way, put her hand out to help yes. her friend. And I thought that was a really just, it was so brief and so tiny, but that moment really hit me of like, yeah. oh, that's, that's so sweet of to Paul. Look at her yeah. in her Vulcan way, trying to put her hand out and help him and him being very vulnerable with a colleague when he normally is not. So I, I loved that scene for that one specific moment, but I do agree with you for the most part. It kind of like, I felt like it was that element got lost in the fact that it didn't have more weight yes. to, to yes. do with the overall aspect of the show and the, the time spent with the rock climbing and the, the clear effort that all of the actors went into. Um, all of them are completely committed to this, but if you want to have the kind, if you still want that rock climbing element in the show, invert what they're doing, start the show with, the Enterprise has responded to a request from D- the Denobulan government to go get these scientists and started off with Archer saying, like, I've got three of my people down on that planet right now getting those scientists. Start with them finding the scientists. Start with yeah. them already having descended. They descended safely. They got down there and now they have found the scientists. And now the episode is the scientists are reluctant to leave. And now the episode is about the tension between the three Enterprise crewmen Mm -hmm. who are basically in a position of like we will force you to go when trip says like i will pull my phaser and shoot you in the butt if you don't get moving like make that the heart of the show now it's not about the tension of oh will three of our main characters die no no it becomes well now we can learn about these other characters and maybe we get committed to them and through the main crew characters bonding with these scientists and giving us an opportunity to get to learn them to be more than just the three stooges because this depiction of the Don- denobulans looked completely yeah. cartoonish they were yes they were kind of blasé in a way that seemed like they had written a character description of flocks from the pilot and they were just mm-hmm. being told to portray that the, his nuance in what a denobulan is is so much more sophisticated than what these three people were were given yeah but if you had an opportunity for them to become truly characters and then on the climb out the best moment of the climbing came when the government became overly aggressive in its pursuit of the former military in a battle that was causing bombing and the shelling that was causing cave-ins if you had 
reversed what was happening. If instead of it being the descent to find the scientist, if the entire episode had started with them finding the scientist, now it's about trying to get out. And as they're trying to get out, the shelling is causing cave-ins. Now we could actually worry about characters because now we don't know if the scientists will live and we could care about them. Yes. So it could be, you know, you could still but have he, one of them get injured. You could still have like the tension of like the, the rock slide and sliding down the face of the cave, but you could have built in like, we know that we're not going to see one of the main characters die. But if you let us have time to get to know the scientists and in particular, focus on one scientist in particular, give us somebody to actually care about as a stand in who then as they're trying to climb out that person being in mortal danger, then that adds the tension that we need. Well, this comes back to for every episode, it should have a theme. What is the theme? What is the point we're trying to say? What's our thesis statement for this story? And A plot, B plot, C plot should always reinforce that theme. And this episode has no coherent theme. Yeah. And so the idea of this militant uh, group that's taken over the the government, it's like if they had taken that storyline, you have the Denobulan, I can't remember what the other species name was that the Denobulans were suppressing and it was like 300 years ago. Zentaran. Before, the Zentaran. So the Denobulan Zentaran conflict that ended hundreds of years ago, but the hatred is still there, could have been reflected in the militant organization that's taken over this new planet of this is a current war of hatred on this yeah. planet. So you have the current example of what's happening. You have the past example of what's happening still stretched over hundreds of years for a lifetime. And those two plots, those two things thematically could have yeah. come together in a more co- cohesive story, but they didn't do that. It was the militant group was purely just a MacGuffin to make this time clock of this rock climbing mission yeah. for no, no reason. And to me, that was the biggest problem for the show is the lack of a coherent theme. The other thing I wanted to bring up about the rock climbing, <laughs> did it bother you at all <laughs> when they show up at the cave entrance and they have these, okay, we have to make their equipment look, look really sci-fi. Okay, so how can we make this look really sci-fi? Okay, let's put lights on gigantic stalks that stick <laughs> way up above their heads. That's not going to be a problem in rock climbing. Yeah. What, what, what? They're standing outside the entrance. I'm like, as they all walk in, they're going to go conk, conk, yeah. <laughs> conk on every rock on the ceiling. And my, my thought first thought was that is the dumbest sci-fi looking like rock climbing gear. It would just be like headlamps. You'd have a headlamp on your head. It's right. all you need. It's like, why are you trying to make this look yeah. cool when it looks ridiculous in the yeah. first two seconds of like, we have these giant stalks that we then have to man- manipulate. I feel like there's this, this hesitation uh, to use headlamps because headlamps are goofy. Look dumb. And yeah, they look dumb. And like, yeah, they do look dumb. But you know, the advantage of a headlamp is it also points the direction your face is looking. So yes, I agreed with you. It was like any time that they had to look around, they had to reach up, find their lamp Whoa. and adjust it so that they could actually get right where they were supposed to be looking. Because you know what you're doing? You're rock climbing. Your hands are busy holding you so yeah. you don't fall. <laughs> it's like, yeah. so let's make a light that you always have to be adjusting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And my last quibble, and I promise yeah. this will be my last quibble. And I know this is a minor one and I know it. it's born largely of you have a series with your main characters and your show has to tell stories using those main characters. I get it. I do get it. But given that, I think that that puts more pressure on the writers to come up with logical, realistic reasons as to why the main characters chosen are the ones doing the thing. We've got scientists. They're deep in these caves. We can't reach them any way other than people literally going down. Who are we going to send? I'll send my pilot, my chief engineer, and my security officer. The yep. only one of those three that made any sense was Reed. The only one that made sense was Reed. If this had been Reed. Well, they did make this, a case for Travis because in previous episodes, he's been the rock climber. And so it's like right. they were like, okay, he's got a ton of rock climbing experience. Right. We do need him. So, okay. Right. But I'm talking about from a, yeah. uh, from a, like, yes. from a, Top down military style operation. You never do this. The only one that made sense was Reed. If you say Reed is in charge of this operation, he is taking Travis along because Travis has extensive rock climbing experience, but Reed has also had training. And then there is a third person who's going to go along. I grow weary of 
of trip being the stand in for like Archer is literally never going on these things unless he gets called in for an extreme reason, Mm -hmm. which is following a logic that the next generation tried to follow. It was always Riker. Riker's job is to be the stand in, but that is not the relationship that trip has on this ship. He's the chief engineer. You're not going to send your chief engineer. And if you needed there to be that stand in, he needed to be a different role on the show. He, he needed to be an executive officer. He needed to be a first officer. They needed to, to recreate that dynamic because just having your chief engineer go down to do rock climbing for no reason. They didn't even try to explain it. It was just, we got three people going down to get these people. One of them is our chief engineer. Gosh, I hope he makes it back. It just, they, it's they could much. have explained, but like the whole reason I was saying that the, they explained Travis because th- we've seen this in previous episodes. He's gone rock climbing. So yes. It's like we've, we, we've seen that. So it's like for him, the explanation made sense. They could have said the scientists that are down there have uh, an engineering setup that yep. they're going to need your expertise yes. to help them put this stuff in a way so that they won't be damaged and all this kind of stuff. So we need your engineering expertise yes. to help them get that. Set yes. up. They could have done that. They could have said anything a two like sentence that. Explanation, I would have been perfectly but they didn't even happy. Try. Yeah, yeah. They didn't even try. They yes. didn't even try. And if you had inverted the the climb in the way that I described, potentially like yeah. start with them finding the scientists. Start with them. They've already successfully made their descent. You could have had part of then the tension being those geologists had taken down something that was effectively some sort of micro power generator. That unless it's shut down in just the right way over a longer period of time would be dangerous. They can't leave it behind and they can't shut it down properly. So he is now helping them fast shut down something that is potentially dangerous that they also have to take out with them. Yep. And that then becomes the explanation for why trip is, is there again another element that adds to the stress of okay are they take are they hauling out something that's a micro power generator that if it doesn't stay stable could potentially harm them all so i like your idea of like give an explanation for him i also agree mayweather has we've we've been told mayweather does this you could have even have simply said reed is going down and mayweather's going down and trip is going down because reed and mayweather Reed and Trip have gone rock climbing, climbing so many times with Mayweather. They're starting to get expertise as well. They're good at it. Yeah. Something could have been said. Instead, it was just, yeah, I'm sending down these guys, including my chief engineer, and I hope he makes it back okay. At that so, point, it might as well have been flocks. Yeah. My only closing thought on this entire episode is not about the episode, but it's about us bagging on this show week after week. Yes. <laughs> I just want to make a call out to the listeners and watchers. I do like this show. And yes. I know there's a lot of people that hate this show. I actually do like this show. We're just in a really bad patch of episodes yeah. on this show. As a collection, by the time we get done with it, there, it left a mark on me that I overall am p- positive on some of the things it did. Yes. But man, there is a run of episodes here that it's just like, wow, this is hard watching right now. <laughs> this is tough. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, and I echo that sentiment of, it is important to remember that we are here because we like Star Trek. <laughs> we, love, we, we love Star Trek. Yeah. It doesn't sound like we yeah. do, but yeah. we love Star Trek. And, yes. and part of the reason for, you know, in some cases, you tend to be more critical of the things you care about. And I think that that's part of it for both of us as well, is that, man, I've seen, there are episodes of Star Trek that can move me to tears in a mm-hmm. heartbeat. And I, in some cases, all I have to do is think about the storyline and I get emotional about the strength of the storytelling and the depth of the characters and the things, the, the overall optimism and idealism of the message of Star Trek as a whole. And all of those things are what bring us here. And when we talk about this particular show in this particular episode, in the way that we do, it does sound very much like piece of crap, piece of crap, piece of crap, but yes, (laughs) 
but I'm with I'm with you, Matt, in that the what brings us here and makes us say this thing is because of a passionate caring for and love for what Star Trek is and what it can be. And the amount of time and effort, like I said, the actors trained for days to be able to do this climbing. They cared about all of this and I care about their time and effort. Yeah. I just wish it had amounted to more. You know, yeah, it's, it's, I wish that it, I wish that while I was watching the episode, I was like, oh God, this, this climbing is, is gripping. And I don't mean that literally, no pun intended, but this, <laughs> I wish I had felt like, oh, this was all worth it instead yeah. of, oh, I wish they had just cut to the chase and showed them finding the scientists and have the scientists be given time to develop as characters so we can actually worry about whether they make it out as mm-hmm. opposed to, you know, do we really think that, oh, Mayweather's leg is broken. Maybe he's leaving the series. No, that's not what we're thinking. Mm-hmm. So listeners, let us know what you think. Do you agree? Is this bagging of the show too much? Or is it, uh, do you agree with us that it's important to give critical feedback to something you care about deeply? We are curious. And uh, I promise you that if the response is like, yeah, you guys bag on this too much, Matt, I can try and pull it back a bit. But I... <laughs> Some people might say you're not punching hard enough. <laughs> yeah. But do let us know. You can reach out through the contact information in the podcast description, or you can weigh in on YouTube in the comments. And before we sign off, Matt, is there anything you'd like to remind our listeners about that you have coming up? On Undecided with Matt Farrell next week, actually, by the time you see this episode that we're recording right now, on my channel, I have an episode about turning the ocean into a battery, which mm-hmm. I thought was a fun one worth checking out so you'll be able to just take your hair dryer to the beach with you and throw the cord into the water and you'll be good to chuck go. your phone into the ocean and it'll be charged up in no time that's right just by the time you're ready to leave <laughs> you'll be at four <laughs> bars as for me you can go to my website seanfarrell.com you can look for information about my books there or you can go to your local bookstore or amazon barnes and noble anywhere books are sold And if you'd like to support the show, please do consider leaving a review at Apple or Google or Spotify or wherever it is that you picked up this podcast. And obviously, if you're watching this on YouTube, just go to the comments there and you can subscribe and you can like and you can become a supporter. All that really does help the show. You can go to trekintime.show and click the become a supporter button there. And that allows you to throw some coins at us. Aim for the head. That's all I have to say. Aim for the head. (laughs) Thank you so much, everybody, for listening or watching, and we'll see you in the next one.